Hello everyone and welcome back to part two of the uh, the current video for Lawrence Place Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2. As ever we are still sponsored by Trefoil.be so if you need a uh, Factorio or Minecraft or various other hostings for your uh, servers for your um, for your games then uh, check check them out. Use the code Lawrence Plays on checkout to get 20% off. So today uh, since I've already talked about what I got up to and what Tristan was doing in the last uh, in the last stream I'm going to talk about Mike and Mark this time. Uh, we'll start off with Mark because he's created this enormity uh, it runs all the way across here and this is a system that essentially gives us well as the, as, the, as the label up here says this is generating free power so what we've got here is we have a, we have a water input over here that pumps pumps water in out of the um, out of the out, out of the uh, the lake and into this giant into, into this giant duct here so this is what I was talking about in the in the last part of the video when I, I was making all of this stuff because I knew mark was going to need it so we've got all of these pumps pumping into this single duct intake which takes the liquids puts them into the duct and then these can now flow we can now flow enormous quantities of water along here so instead of there being a hundred per pipe section there's 1200 per pipe section um, and that allows for much greater flow throughput and allows us to transport and I think probably allows us to transport fluids long distances with much lower drop off and loss so we've got this going coming along here and then coming out up to here where it's linked in here to a, a, a duct exhaust which pulls the liquids out of the or the fluids rather because it could be it could be gases as well it put in but in this case it's water it pulls it back out and puts it into a pipe that then runs along all of these um, runs along these um, these greenhouses that are set up here and so the clever thing that we're doing here is that the greenhouses are turning that water into wood and it's a relatively slow recipe this is really noisy I'll, 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 I'll make sure I turn this down in the um, in the actual video but here we go it, it takes in water and it produces wood it's simple so simply it turns 800 water and 120 sec value very valuable seconds into 20 wood and so that's creating all of this wood around here I'm gonna have to turn it down myself there we go right creates all creates all of this wood that's on these um, on these belts around here and this is used for a number of things uh, well, no, actually, no, sorry, no, it's used, used, used for one thing. That is then transferred into these um, fuel refineries, and this uses the biomethanol recipe, which takes in wood and oxygen and steam and produces biomethanol. Now, we're making the oxygen down here in this um, atmospheric condenser, because, and one of these is plenty for all of these machines. It's a relatively, um, it's a relatively low throughput recipe, and you can produce quite a lot of oxygen from here. And we've also got an electric boiler up here producing the steam that we need for, for this recipe. Um, and we're also 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 using a couple of efficiency modules in here to take the amount of power used by these down from being uh, 200 kilowatts to 33 kilowatts. And that's fairly important <clears throat> because this is a power station. Once we've created the biomethanol, it's then piped straight into these gas power plants here. And these are producing a decent chunk of energy. And so between them all, we are producing between all of, essentially all of this, we're converting water into wood, and that plus oxygen and steam into biomethanol, and the biomethanol into electricity. And this system produces in total. I I, I don't know. I don't have the maths. Let me see if I can find the maths. So I haven't precisely done the maths for all of this, but it is producing a lot more power than it's using. I think these, I think each one of these modules produces something like 200 megawatts or something significant like that. We we worked out that it's significantly denser. It produces more power per square than a um, than solar would. However, it is significantly more complicated. However, I mean, if you if you think about it, this is in its own way. This is sort of solar with extra steps because we're growing trees, um, and that is basically that's that solar power. You tu you're turning sunlight into into wood energy, and then we're burning, then we're turning converting that in various different ways into the into the methanol, and then we're burning that to produce power. So basically, this is this is a solar power plant just with slight some extra complications to make it a bit more um, a bit more efficient and a bit more uh, a bit more productive. Now, one of the things we considered is is perhaps putting. Um, efficiency modules into the uh, greenhouses as well because the greenhouses take quite a lot of power they can take 200 kilowatts each and that's not an enormous amount on its own I mean these things spit out four and a half megawatts uh, these use these using 33 kilowatts but it's it's a significant proportion of the power that's being used by this whole system however one of the reasons we haven't done that is because if you put efficiency modules in greenhouses sure they they use less electricity but they also absorb less pollution because the um, if you notice over there on the right, it says pollution is minus five per minute. When you put in an efficiency module, it reduces the um, uh, the energy consumption by typically 40% for a tier one. Um, let's 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 check these and make sure I get the numbers right. So here we go. It reduces the energy consumption by 40% and the pollution by 10%. So that will bring these down to only using only dealing with 4.4 and a half pollution a minute, which is obviously less. Or we put two of them in, less it only be uh, minus four pollution a minute. So it's a bit less, and having these in here is quite nice for, for dealing with a bit of the pollution. 
That said, in order to, it wouldn't be sufficient to deal with the, all the pollution that's produced by the uh, by the processes in the middle and the burning here because it yeah it, it just 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 isn't the greenhouses don't suck in that much uh, that much um, pollution. So we've got these in the middle as well, the air purifiers. And so we've got a belt coming down here with the clean um, purifier uh, filters and then another belt to take the dirty ones away, like this as you can see. And as usual they're then taken up to an outpost station here. This is this is an output station that doesn't have any of the ammunition or the building or any of that sort of stuff because this is obviously not a, um, not a defensive outpost, this is merely an air cleaning outpost so it only needs this part. And so we've got it programmed here to, to, to watch for a shortage of um, a shortage of air filters or an excess of dirty air filters and if it gets to either of those then it'll call a train to come in and sort that out. But down here, yep, we are merrily producing lots and lots of electricity. We're cleaning up all of the pollution from it. If I, if I zoom back out, if I go back into map view and turn on the pollutionometer, then you can see there's a bit of pollution sort of in the middle of here, but it's not there's not very much of it, and most of it is getting sort of and most of it is getting dealt with before it gets too far. So I think we're doing quite well here, and I believe we've worked we've done the maths to work out we've worked out that four of these scrubbers should be enough to deal with all of the pollution produced by the um, produced by this process. And any that's missed will hopefully be picked up by the by the greenhouses around the outside. So this is a really neat little system that produces in as much free power as we want. And as you can see, we've got quite a lot of these, but we could put in more of them if we wanted. They're, they are all they require is a water input and an, and a and I suppose a filter input. Here it comes. Here comes the train to uh, to drop off some filters and to pick up the dirty ones and take them away. So. Yeah, all we actually require here is a system to drop off these filters and and somewhere to provide us with all of the all of the water we need, um, like this. And then we can produce we can produce free power basically anywhere we want. So we could we could go around we could just fill up convenient little gaps in the in in the base where we where where, where there isn't room to do anything else useful. Like perhaps up here above my uh, red circuit factory. This this is going to be an area that where we don't really have we're not gonna we don't have railway lines going up here, so it's going to be difficult to put bring anything in here or. Just other little areas underneath the bus, all the way across here, is probably an area where we won't really put anything in. So again, having a massive air power generation facility across there would be quite nice. So th this is this is a good way of producing producing power. Just and all you're using up really is space and and I suppose water. So it, it's a it's a really nice little uh, self-contained system. And it's a it's like think of it as a, a sort of a more advanced version of the, of, of solar, uh, especially as it carries on running all night long without without um, needing to without needing to stop power stop powering your uh, your factory because you've uh, because it's got dark. And that I suppose is one of the advantages that Dyson Sphere program has over Factorio, because Factorio planets are flat. You've got this um, <laughs> in in space exploration, you can explore the entire planet, and you just get a big circle. So every single planet in the in the Factorio space exploration world uh, universe is actually a disc world. Whereas in in Dyson Sphere program, they're actual proper spheres, so you can you can put a beam receiver on one side, and you can put a beam receiver on the other side, and then link them up with um, uh, with pylons, and you've got power all of the time. So yeah. Um, <laughs> that is one of the nice things about a 3D game, I suppose. But as it is, this is a lovely system. It's it's completely it's completely power. It's completely self-contained, apart from needing a water and a filter input, and it just generates power and doesn't generate pollution. So yeah, this is great. I'm very very happy with this. This is lovely, and has now pretty much replaced, or at least should be replacing, any of these sort of power stations. These are still ticking over. Actually, we should probably be pulling these out and replacing them at some point because all these are is pollution generation stations now compared to the other ones. They're not really worth. They're not really worth having at all. Uh, in fact, you can see there's quite a lot of red around here. E um, so yeah, it's generally not worth having. And we've we've pulled out the um, the old power station we used to have down here because again, it's just not needed. We've got we've got better ways of producing electricity now, which is very nice. Um, this one, oh, this one's gone gone to sleep, this one's gone idle, that's great. So there's presumably some sort of system in here that either tells it not to, no, it can't be telling it not to use these because these are the same sort of systems. Let's have a look at the, let's have a look at the power grid again. Oh, it's just been cut off completely. This is now, oh no, it hasn't. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure why these aren't run. Oh, they've they've had their fuel inputs disconnected. That's why. So yeah, these have actually been disconnected. No, they have. Ah, there's a pump down here that's um that's not running, and I don't know what that's connected to. Oh, so that's that's to get rid of any excess petroleum gas. So if we have too much petroleum gas, we can get rid of it through this system in order to turn it into electricity. But otherwise. We won't be using these power plants because we don't need the power from them. There's, there's as I say, better, much better ways of generating electricity. So that's really rather nice. That's quite, that's quite clever. It's, it's, it's a lovely, um, a lovely self-contained, nice, clean power generation system. The other big thing that Mark has done in the, um, in the last session, is, uh, is, is this, this is a bit more, this is quite interesting. So a grid isolation system down here and a coronal mass ejection backup power, power system here. So what we've got here 
I'll, I'll sort of start from the end and work backwards because I think it's going to make, make sense to do so. This is essentially a massive steam battery and emergency power plant. So across the top here we've got the huge storage tanks that Mark asked me to make and I was talking about briefly because, well, I made them for him. Um, and each one of these is storing 200,000 steam at 500 degrees C. So there's a lot of potential energy stored up in the steam here that we can use. So these are, as I say, these are just big steam batteries. We can use these for power as and when we need to. These are all then hooked up to massive ranks of, um, of, of, of steam turbines, which means if we, if we need the power from them, we can blow the steam out through the turbines and generate a lot of power over, granted over a relatively long time, but Mark has again, once again done the maths for this and concluded that we would need 240 steam turbines in order to defeat the maximum amount of power that gets produced by the, um, by the coronal mass ejection. So here we go. Peak, to, peak power is 2.28 gigawatts. Um, over, and it's 182 gigajoules over 120 seconds, and it's going to happen in 16 hours, so we need to get a shift on to make sure we sort this out. So 2.228 gigawatts, these produce 10 megawatts each, so we need 228 of them, and we've got 240. So we've got enough here to produce, to actually produce enough power to, um, to, to tank the peak of the coronal mass ejection power demands. And that's really impressive. In my single player playthrough, the 0.5 series that you've probably all already watched, um, because that did quite well. <laughs> um, I didn't manage to block my first couple of coronal mass ejections. I ended up having to just sort of tank them and hope for the best. And one of them went through and just wrecked my, uh, an enormous, um, uh, my green circuit production facility, taking out hundreds and thousands of, um, of green circuits. That was rather expensive. And we don't want that sort of thing to happen again because we're quite short of stone and we don't have an enormous amount of copper. So we thought we'd probably we'd try and defend against this one. Uh, we've done the researches needed to make the um, umbrella defences. Here it is. Umbrella defence. Here we go. So we've, we've done the research to make this. Um, we don't have blue circuits yet though. So that's going to be my, my next priority I think is going to be to make the blue circuits in order to then be able to make the uh, the, the umbrella defence facility. And then once we've got that we can drop that in. We'll probably drop it in sort of up here somewhere because it makes a sort of sense to do so. Um, and then that'll be, and then it'll be, just keep everything, the coronal mass ejection stuff in one place. And then that'll be a nice system that can just deal with the coronal mass ejection if and when it happens. Now that's not—I mean that—that's nice to have, and that is a good—a good thing. It's nice that we've managed to build this up, and hopefully, he, I believe he's also done the maths to work out that the two hundred thousand steam in each of these. So one, two, three, four. The hundred and the one point six million steam we've got across here is presumably going to have enough energy to then actually tank the entire one hundred and eighty-two gigajoules we need. Uh, we'll, we'll, we shall see, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully have enough power to just tank the entire entire coronal mass ejection but we'll, we'll see how that goes so all of that steam has been produced by these electric boilers here that are hooked up to a water input which comes from the same massive duct we were talking about before there's a little bleed off it there um, and then is powered by uh, by these accumulators now this is the really clever part if i zoom out a bit and turn on the uh, electric networks you can see there are actually three electric three and a half electrical networks here. So this is the main one, the one that runs the entire base. The entire base is running off this, and so it obviously it's linked into the um, this system here that's producing the free electricity. And then over here, we're, any, we're using the Factorio um, built-in internal logic to charge it to, to, to say that the um, the accumulators here will be charged by any, any spare power on the network. So the way Factorio works is firstly it will use any power from solar generation because it, it's aware that that's free. Then it will use any power generated by steam because that's not free. Um, I'm not quite sure how the gas generators fit in on that um, but it's sort of irrelevant to what I'm saying at the moment. So the idea is, it'll, and then after that, it'll use the accumulators as emergency but top-up power. So firstly, it'll use solar power because it's free. Then it'll use the steam power as a backup, and then it'll use the um, solar the accumulators as, as a backup for that. And that means if you're doing vanilla solar panel systems and you've got your massive solar panels and accumulator arrays, you need to act. And then you've got, and then if you have some steam power systems for backup on that, you need to actually put in um, switches and control systems in order to make sure that your steam systems don't kick in and until your accumulators are empty, because otherwise Factorio will, by default, use the steam before it uses the accumulators. However, in this case, um, we're, we're using that to our advantage. The other thing it does is, for, for when power is being used, firstly, it'll, it'll power all of your machines, and then if you've got still got free power, it'll charge up the accumulators. If you haven't got enough power, it'll discharge them. So that means any spare electricity on the network is going to go into charging these accumulators, but it will only charge them up if there's, if there's, a, if there's a surplus. 
After that, the then turns we've then got the separate electric networks. You see, this these two are actually not linked. If I zoom in all the way here, you can see there is no copper cable linking these two um, these two uh, substations. There is linking horizontally, but not vertically. And you can see here, there's, there is a cable coming off the bottom one, going off down here. So that means that these these electric uh, these electric boilers down here are only running off the power in the accumulators. So if we had a shortage of power in the in the base and total, these accumulators would get discharged, producing the electric producing the steam down here, and then they wouldn't charge up again. Which means these boilers won't leach power from the rest of the base if there's a if there's ever a shortage of it. They'll just use any excess. So, so that's quite clever. It puts in a sort of a nice bridge there that allows us to use the power in stages like that. And then we've then got, we haven't linked across here. So then we've got the next step is we're turning the, the, the steam is then being put into here. And if we do need, if we then do need the power out of these, we have a switch in here that will link it to the main electrical grid. So we can flick that switch manually should we want to. There's no, no control circuitry on it. This is, a, this is very much a manual switch to turn on when there's about to be a coronal mass ejection. And at that point, We'll start powering the uh, the base off the steam power hit available from here, and all of that power will be available for the coronal mass ejection. Now, what we might actually end up doing is putting in the umbrella defence about here, and getting rid of that switch, because if we do that, let's 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 drop a let's drop an example uh, def umbrella defence in. It's probably going to be in here. Yes, let's put this in. Well, there's there's some text in the way. I'll put it on top then. Let's let's get rid of that for now because that was in the way right let's try that again so if i put in the the uh the defense there like that so now this is powered from both networks i'm not quite sure how this is going to work but if we go if we get rid of the switch in the middle as well then that means that the, this will be powered off this network but it will also pull power from this one as well so if it needs more power it can leach from both sides i don't know whether this is actually a good idea whether we'd be better off just linking that through there but if we did do it like this then we'd, we'd, be, we'd be saying essentially that this power is reserved just for the uh, coronal mass ejection um system and it would power, power it it would, this should be capable of producing enough power but we've also got the top up coming from here if necessary so this might be a nice way to do it we may do it like this we may not bother because as it is we should actually just be able to put this in over here somewhere and go yeah well that's going to be enough because we've got enough power coming in from from all of this uh, we've, we've done the math this should be able to tank it but if we get a bigger one later it, it, it might be nice to do it like this it might it might not might be just a bit of a waste of time but it's it's a possibility anyway uh, let's undo all of that <laughs> right, so that's that's the um, the system here that marks it, and I think that's pretty clever. The, the way we've got the, the grid isolation system up here with the um, with the, the double um, substations in here. So they're all all the substations are linked to all of the accumulators, but they're not linked to each other. So you've got that that break in the in the electrical network, and then another break across here, where we, so we don't we don't risk t taking the steam power from here and turning it back into using the boilers to turn it back into steam, which would be a, a loop and probably quite wasteful. So yeah, this is all this is all a nice system. I'm I'm, I'm um, I'm quite impressed with this. I think it's going to be really, really good, and I'm almost looking forward to the uh, the next coronal mass ejection in about 16 hours. That's going to that's going to test it, and we can find out if it actually works. Of course, that relies on me, you know, making the umbrella defence for it. But as long as I can get that done, we should be okay. The other thing Mark has done is put in a, a coal mine. No, it's not coal mine. A stone mine down here on this patch. This is a 1.3 million stone patch. It's not producing stone all that quickly, which is a bit of a shame because we really, really need stone at the moment. We're very, very short of it. Uh, so we're trying to decide what to do about that. But, in, but basically, he's dropped. He's dropped in a standard, pretty much a standard coal, uh, stone mine here. Uh, it goes to a, a balancing warehouse here. Feeds out to these warehouses that gradually fill up until eventually we'll hopefully have enough stone for a train to come along and pick it up, which we haven't yet. We're waiting for eight thousand. We've got seven thousand two hundred, and it's pretty slow. The only notable thing really about this, because it's a, it's basically it's a very much a standard mine design, is that because we've got because it's so close to the walls, we've got the uh, belt coming out here with the um, with the filters on it. So we just put some extra filters in around here, and then we can divert the one that brings them back again to go around here and put in even more filters. So this is going to be a nice clean mine as they go. Um, not 100. percent I mean, there's a little bit down here that's, that these are going to be sucking up, but it's not it's not escaping and it's not going off to upset the biters. So I'd say this is working very nicely from a pollution point of view. It's just keeping itself clean. We've also had an expansion to the um, the, the system over here. Where we, where is it? Here, here we go. So we're we're unloading all the dirty filters here. They're being passed up this belt um, along here, and then this has been massively expanded. I think there are about half a dozen of these machines and two of these before. Uh, so now we've got a lot more machines that are taking in the dirty filters and washing them out. So that means it's, that's a simple simple system where you take in water, you 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 clean the filters out with with the water. 
and then dirty water comes out onto this pipe, clean filters come out onto this belt, and the dirty and the dirty water then goes into these machines, which take it in. And there are various recipes you can use. At the moment, we're using the one that produce, that turns it into stone and a uh, 30% chance of stone, 10% chance of iron ore, and you get most of the water back as well. We don't really care about water because water's free, but we do care about the stone and the iron ore because that's those are useful for the um, for the products for the systems we're trying to we're trying to um, trying to produce. Now there are various options in here. You can do one that where it, uh, no, you can do one where it produces. Um, a stone and iron ore you can do one where it produces stone and copper ore or you can do one where it produces stone and raw rare metals i thought there was one way you could do um where it just produces slightly more stone but apparently not um that's that's different uh so we have the choice between iron or copper or rare metals we're doing the iron one because iron is the resource we're most short of because if we look up here in the uh, in the smeltery area you can see that we have now filled up to the the, these warehouses are with copper to the point where there's no more copper required whereas over here we've got actually we've got these are mostly full but not quite as full and also we, we need to turn copper into steel as well so over do, 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 do here no here we're also turning no we need to turn iron into steel steel not copper so the iron ore also comes out of here goes along here up into here where it turns into iron and then into into steel up here along with the supply of coke that's being passed through uh, so we don't have anything like as much steel it's not enough as you can see by the fact these warehouses are completely empty and we're still trying to load a train up so yeah we, we need we need a lot more iron than we do copper um, unfortunately there's a bit of a shortage of iron ore patches in the um, inside the base uh, there, there, were, there, there was there's a decent amount of copper, but not very much iron. We've taken these two iron mines up here. We're plundering those for all they're worth. But we're at the stage of the game where you need a lot more iron than you do copper. So those aren't really able to keep up. Whereas the two copper out mines over here are absolutely fine. There is another iron ore patch here, actually. I think it's going to be worth building an iron, iron mine on this one to get a bit more flowing in. Because if we look over here at the iron ore drop-off, we can see that there's um, nowhere for this train to go to go and get some more iron ore. So... Clearly, we don't have enough iron iron ore being dug up over. Oh, that's, so there's, hmm, maybe there's a train already on its. No, there isn't already a train on its way here. I don't know why that's broken. There should be a, there should be a train going here in order to pick this up. Oh, there's um there's a decider combinator missing there. So this station, <laughs> that's why we're so short of iron. This mine has not been being used for a good while um, because this this combinator doesn't doesn't exist that's that's actually a ghost as you can tell if I zoom out it looks purple so we'll need to go in and fix that then that'll be okay but I think it's going to be worth setting up another iron mine here because we're getting through a lot of iron ore and yeah basically we need it stone is as I said more of a problem um, there's a little bit of copper there um, there's this, there's a small patch of stone somewhere about here which is but it's only like 800,000 835,000 it's not a great deal more, more iron patches up here um, there's yeah, so that's not really very much. There's no more. I'm pretty sure there's no more stone inside our um, inside our area of control. But I believe there were a couple of patches that somebody found just outside it. Uh, I don't know where those were. I think they said they were just off to the. Oh, there's one. There's four four and a half million there, and five five million out there. So we've got right. We've got about ten million over here. So I guess we could send Mike out for another exploratory mission to build a wall across here, across here, across here and across here and then to take out all the biters in the middle just because that that should be that should, shouldn't take him long i mean maybe maybe one stream maybe 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 it'll take him a month i'm not sure <laughs> oh dear but yeah there's he um i feel slightly bad isn't quite the right word because he does seem to he does seem to quite enjoy going out and fighting spending all the time fighting the biters but there he had i do feel like mike has spent most of the game so far going out just taking out endless biters which is why there's so many of these um mike graves dotted around the map compared to everyone else because he's the one who's been doing all the hard work there if we're being quite honest with, <laughs> with you it's not really it's not that he's especially prone to dying it's just that he's doing the doing the dangerous stuff but yeah a bridge across the, a wall across there and there and uh, i don't know i don't know how far we want to go but there are a couple of stone patches out here we could go out and, and, and try and, and try and liberate and that would help quite a bit the other thing we could do is set up some more core mining. So there's there's a few core seams left, and now that we have unlimited power because of this, these sort of systems and just being able to copy these as much as we need, we've got uh, there's one there, there's one there that's just about accessible. There, there, got that one already. You see, there's, there's quite a lot of these core seams around. There's one there that we could probably get to with a bit of a bridge going out that way, and that one is easily as well, and up there. So there's lots of these core seams around. So we just, I think, setting it, going out and just setting up some extra little core mines on those would be a good idea. Now it will, it will reduce the amount of, of um, core fragments each of these drills in, individually produces because um, the more of them you have, the less each individual drill produces. But the more you still, you still get more in total. The formula is you get each. 
in total you get the square you multiply it by the square root of the number of drills so the more drills you have the more you get in total but the less you get per drill this really does not look like the same amount going in as coming out but I'm, I'm, I'm aware that's because this is a yellow these yellow belts and these are red belts but even so that looks like a lot more than is, is coming back out it isn't but it looks like it um, speaking of core mining, my, uh, Mark also um, linked up these the, the extra core miners, the ones that are solar powered, onto the main network. Now that we have, as pre previously mentioned, unlimited power, we might as well have these running 24-7, or however long Factorio days and weeks are. Just have them running all the time, because we don't need to turn them off during the night. And that's going to double the amount of core fragments we get out of them. So that's very worth doing. And that's going to help with the stone supply and ev the everything else supply as well. So, yeah, there's 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 lots of, exp lots of um, tweaks and things that have been going on there. But... We do still need a lot more, a lot more stone. Uh, if we if we have a look in the in in the uh, in the in the mind in the areas up here, Ooh, here's the train. Huh, that's stupid. So this train won't go in to unload until this one's gone. Um, that's problematic. I shall I shall I shall alert Tristan to that because the trains are his problem. I mean his fault. I mean I don't know what I mean. So at the moment we do have a, the tr this train has just arrived as you can tell by the fact that these belts are only just filling up along here. Um, but we are unloading the stone out of out of here. So we do have some stone coming in. Um, and now because we've got a decent flood of it, you can see yeah you can see the gaps in it along here. We've got enough. Okay, so we've got enough stone being made that we now have sufficient stone bricks. Letting it flow along here. We're producing the gla we're producing the glass and the and the silicon. And actually, we have decent amounts of these, so maybe we're not quite as short of stone as I thought we were. Um, maybe the maybe have opening up this mine down here has has helped, and we've now caught up a decent amount. Or maybe it's because I've been making videos for the last couple of hours, and therefore not really making stuff on the base down on the bus down here. So the the the, this, the factory has mostly gone to sleep. We'll find out in the next stream, I guess. But yeah, actually, that that's better than I thought it was. So I think we, whilst we do need to have more stone and more iron ore available, it's not quite as serious as I thought it was. Mark also picked up a number of the little things that I've been mentioning in my in my previous stream that needs to be done. So he stripped out the um, the the oil refining that was being done here. This is just, as I think I said, is just sitting here to use up the remaining petro petroleum gas in these tanks. It's nearly done that. So once that's finished and we've used all of that up, this can be pulled out as well. There's no point in wasting a couple of tanks of petroleum gas. You might as well use it for something. And in this case, uh, <laughs> Well, we're using it for power, which is, is kind of wasteful, but never mind, I guess. He's put in some more air purification in places. Like, I think I think he did the did big oil, because big oil was pretty dirty before. So now over here we've got another... Um, have, we got, have we got air purification down here? Let's have a look at this. Maybe we haven't. No, I don't think we have actually got air purification here. But it's kind of stopped. And we're, oh, we're not generating electricity here anymore, so the pollution generation is much less bad. So that's not so serious. But I think that cover that certainly covers all of the major things he's done. The, the, the big the big important things were the power generation and the coronal mass ejection power steam battery thing up here. Those are the big exciting headline important things he's done. And then there's a, a stone mine down there, which is very very important as well, but but slightly less exciting because you know we, we've done mines before. So yeah, some very useful stuff in there. Uh, Mike has, as usual, been doing doing combaty stuff. So he finished clearing out this area here. Died a few times, as we can see. Um, but by having cleared this area out, it now meant there was a nice place for this power generation to be put in. It's sort of tucked away out of the way, and we didn't have anything else that we wanted to put in here. So that's quite good. And he's put in the walls around it to, to keep to keep it safe as well, so we don't need to worry about the biters coming in. And this is a convex corner, which is annoying for um, Roboport repair systems when you put them in. Oh, he's probably just yeah, he's just covered the whole thing with. Uh, okay, so the problem with this is if if a um, if a bot has just repaired a piece of wall up here and then another one needs to be repaired down here, the bot will prob may fly over the the uh, no man's land in between and might get shot down by spitters. However, since the um, the Roboports are both behind the wall, pretty much. It might actually be okay, because one that comes finishes here will fly down to here, and then when it flies up, it'll go over here. One that finishes up here will fly to here, and then, okay, if it comes over to here, there's a tiny bit where it comes outside, but only a very tiny bit. So this might actually be alright, despite the usual problem. Because it's, it's such a short wall that it kind of gets round the traditional concave wall problem. We also don't have any weapons that do splash damage. In Angel Pops, I couldn't do this sort of configuration, because if I put a plasma turret here, it would shoot across to here, to bite to here, and destroy everything in this area. But these are bullet weapons that don't do splash damage, so that's fine. We don't need to worry about that here. It's going to be much, much safer. Um, he's also added in the, uh, the the stations and things for the new walls. Um, we've got, as I as I, I think I've mentioned a few times in the in the last episode, and in just in general when I've been doing them, I've just been copying Mark's design for this sort of this uh, nice. Um, sushi belt that goes around here because it just works so why not copy it in paste it in it 
it just works it's, 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 it's a good it's a good design why would I reinvent the wheel so yeah happy with that it works nicely I will take some I'll take some of the credit for this design because I put in the RoboPort parts of it as well but uh, <laughs> it kind of doesn't also doesn't matter uh, Mike hasn't realized that you can put these things into construction mode rather than um, rather than mixed mode if we do that let's let's try that let's see what that is if I, if I take this one and I put that over to um, oh no it's in construction mode it's this one that's in normal mode so put all of them into construction mode then we more than cover this area do we actually that makes me wonder if we actually need if I tell if I mark these two for deconstruction do we actually need them yes yes we do we can't quite get that bit down there so we do need that extra one down there um, but we don't need we didn't need the additional one in the top there okay well it, it, it's, it's a couple of it's a, it's a single robot board it doesn't really matter We're, they're not exactly expensive <laughs> um, so yeah he's been working on that presumably he, he's done exactly the same thing up here so the same sort of station same sort of pollution control same sort of biter controls it it just works. We've got we've got a nice design for this. He's, and he's even used the uh, the the radar two, uh, the radar the, the, the is that a Mark two radar? Is it? No, I think that's a Mark one radar. Okay, that's only a Mark one radar. He hasn't used the Mark two radars. These could be upgraded. That would give us a little bit more sight out into the bitery areas. But to be honest, it doesn't really matter. We've got it, we've got full coverage here. It it wouldn't make an enormous difference. He's been doing a little bit with the. Um, with the uh, the warehouses of shame, so down here we've got the we've got as 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 I've mentioned many a time, we've got the two big yellow warehouses here that just fill up with with nonsense, the sort of nonsense that people dump out of their inventory and let the bots deal with. So a lot of this should be in other places. Um, <clears throat> so far it isn't particularly. What's that? Oh, is that a grappling gun? Okay. So we've got we've got all the various things in here that could be put somewhere else, could be put somewhere a bit more sensible and dealt with appropriately, um, but haven't been. They've just got dumped in here. Now this is better than it used to be because Mike has been coming in and taking all the ores out and things like that. But there are still a few things in here that need a little bit of tidying up. So there's still a little bit of ore left because that's that's kind of inevitable. Um, if anything, maybe we should have a station that accepts it. Maybe we, I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't bother with any of that. Or we, actually, we could. We could have we could have a. Um, because our robo area extends up to up to here, in fact, that's quite a long way. Um, up here, we could have a um, so some ch some chests up here that are asking for the copper ore, the coal, the, the copper ore, coal, iron ore, rare metal ore, and basically all those things, and then just dump them out onto this belt, which bypasses. This is the belt that bypasses the um, core fragment chip pr processing, and then just dumps it straight into here. So if we did that, then we'd be able to deal. We'd be able to just get rid of it all straight out that way. So I'll suggest to him that he does that for next time, and it'll it'll mean a bit less stuff that he has to deal with manually. And everybody likes it. Everybody likes automation. That's why we play Factorio. <laughs> and as mentioned before, we've got we've got the problem around here with the with the belts, where do, 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 do all of yeah all of the single cylinder engines have stopped being passed along here because there's more because this is only passing them through when there's less than a hundred in the logistics system um, if I make that a thousand then it'll start working again because there's about 139 in the box up here they need to be taken from there and put into this chest just to, to stop that sort of thing happening and then this this one has it has the filter set but because there already were some up here they haven't been brought over here because we need you need more advanced logistics for that to be a thing. Still, this is going. This is going now. I've, now that I've done that, things this will start to stop flow again. This things should start to work. But we need to do that in in the real in the real game. Mike has also done some upgrading in the smeltery. This is not the smeltery. He's done some upgrading in the smeltery. So all the way along here now, we're now using electric furnaces. So this is this is a nice improvement from the um, from the old ones we're using. We used to be using the steel furnaces up here. So now these are the electric ones. It's taken a bit of a bit of redesign because they're bigger. So he's had to make the whole presumably had to make the whole thing a bit wider. Although given these belts seem to be coming down in the same place, he's either put in fewer of them or he's shifted it a bit more across to the right. Since we've still got four belts coming in, I'm going to assume it's just been made wider off to the right, which is good. I mean that makes makes sense. It's it's the the obvious thing to do. And I think he pro looking at the amount of gaps in here. I think he did deliberately left enough space to do that. So well done there. Um, so this is allowing us to produce all of the all of the metals we need. So this is going reasonably well, apart from you know source of supply shortages. The, and there are a couple of advantages to using the um, using using the electric furnaces. One is that you can they, they run off electricity rather. So they they're running off the um, Press the right buttons, Lawrence. So they're now running off the free electricity being produced up here, rather than burning processed fuel. So that's a saving in coal, pretty much, which is which is great because we don't have enormous quantities of it. Um, so that's yeah, so saving saving quite a lot of power, saving a lot of a lot of resources there, and also it means they're producing a lot less pollution. Now they are still producing some pollution, sure, because they're they're smell trees. They're going. It's a dirty process, but at least they're not burning the processed fuel as well. So this is now a bit cleaner than it was before. The other big advantage. 
is that uh, we can now put modules in them should we should we feel the urge so we can shove in a couple of product productivity modules into here maybe we'll wait until we've got productivity three or maybe two i don't know because at the moment sticking in two prod ones will only get us an eight percent boost and it'll slow the system down but the system is not running flat out so I think that's probably worthwhile. I think we should we probably should fill all of these up with productivity modules in order to get that eight, that eight percent. It's it's not a lot, but it's all, but it's better than nothing. And I think it'd be worth having that, especially now that we have so much power available. So yeah, that's the thing I think we should do uh, probably across all of these things because we're short of all of the input resources. So yeah, having having at least having having another eight percent on the output would be great, and even more so over here for the steel because. Well, actually, these are still steel furnaces. He hasn't upgraded this part yet. But that would be 8% here, and then another 8% here, which is getting close to 20%, because 1.08 1 coming out of here, and then times 1.08 again, which is going to be nearly 20%, but not quite. I'll have to do, I'll, I'll do the maths and put the number up on screen, <laughs> because I can't do that number in my head very easily. He's also upgraded the uh, core pulverizing over here, so he rec we rec it looks like when a, when a train comes in and drops off like this, um, I, the system, the system. Actually, having a look at this, there's, that's that's the previous trains load still going in up here. So actually, we are, uh, yeah, we're bleh, the okay. The the upgrading that's happened here is probably probably a little more than is actually needed because these machines are not running flat out. In fact, they but they're running at almost 50%. So yeah, basically what he's done is he's come in and copied and pasted that, doubled it across here. So we've got twice as many twice as many pulverizers and he's upgraded it all to red belt so we can get a lot more flowing through here and a lot more and therefore a lot more coming out the top here and being made into absolutely everything we need. Now interestingly, we're going to start uh, we're starting to stockpile copper in here because we have more copper than we know what to do with. Um, that's good because when I turn on the red circuit factory over here, that's going to slurp up an enormous quantity of copper. So it's good that we've got a buffer set up. <laughs> oh dear. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's actually a really good thing. Um, but we've got, yeah, we've now got twice the capacity here for crushing and pulverizing. And maybe once we put in more, um, more, 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 uh, core mining drills we're going to these tra this train is going to be working a bit harder bringing in, in, in a bit more often and we're going to want to upgrade all of this to red belts as well just to bring it through a bit faster and then we'll probably start using a bit more of this and generally we'll get a lot more of the resources coming through so this is this is all tying together into my we need more resources thing as i was talking about earlier <laughs> how are the fluids doing okay the pyroflux is starting to be generated a bit faster than it's being used up so we need a bit more of this to use it up or perhaps maybe we actually want to start stockpiling the pyroflux because I think at some point in the not too distant future we're going to start needing that for reasons. Um, I don't know exactly what those reasons are yet, but I think filling up all of these tanks and having lots and lots of it available is going to be very, very valuable in the future. So maybe we'll stop burning it into for, uh, burning it for electricity at some point fairly soon. <laughs> right, so that covers pretty much what everyone's been doing. Uh, let's have a quick look at the death counter. So Mike has got himself up to 13 deaths. There'll be one of these ones up here is presumably a new one. And nearly all of those have been to worms. Um, tw uh, yes, in fact, the newest one was to a worm. We've got 12 deaths to worms so far. Mark has died four times. Um, one of one of which was to a train, which is always funny. Uh, I've died once, and still Tristan has not died at all. So um, he's obviously not 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 playing, spending much time on the front lines. Either that, or he's better at combat than he's letting on. I, I'm I'm not sure which. Uh, we've yes. Yeah, so, so as I say, we've had now had 12 deaths to worms. We've had three to biters, two to spitters, and one to a cargo wagon. <laughs> Right, so it's time to wind up the episode. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to check out our, our sponsor. That's uh, trefoil.be slash lawrenceplays. Link in the description. Use the code lawrenceplays to get 20% off your first order. And don't forget to come along for the uh, stream on Monday. We'll be uh, continuing with all of the stuff I've been talking about. Lots lots more resource gathering to go on. Go around. May maybe some more stone. May maybe maybe some more throwing mic biters. Um, maybe just setting up some more mines. And we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. See what we seem, what we seem to be short of. But getting an umbrella defense... Getting an umbrella defence up and running is definitely top of the list uh, because we've only got 16 hours before that uh, um, before that coronal mass ejection hits, and that's only about three streams, so it's, it's actually not that far off. We want to get that up and running, so that's going to mean blue si blue circuits, and then everything from from there onwards. We'll see how that goes. There'll be the um, Dyson Sphere program stream on Wednesday, and as always, there'll be the catch-up videos at the weekend. Life is still a bit too busy, I'm afraid, for me to be putting in more um, more extra videos, but I'm I'm hoping that these ones are enough to tide you over until until I can um, until I can find the time in my life again to to start doing a bit more stuff. So, as ever, thank you for watching. I hope you're enjoying the outro here and, uh, and, and spotting all of the differences that pop up each episode. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.